Yes, 63, no, 46. There were no abstention. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. And the final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10675 in the name of Drew Smith on Gaza. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Mr Smith, if you are ready, would you open the debate please seven minutes or thereby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to uh, all of those members who have signed my motion, and I hope that the range of views, which no doubt exist across the Chamber, uh, will have the opportunity of an airing this evening. Um, in drafting a motion which I hoped as many members as possible um, could support, and which would therefore stand a chance of uh, reaching the floor, um, I tried to provide a form of words which would maximise the, the broadest possible support, and I hope um, that this debate will play a small, a small part. Uh, and a much needed effort to assure the victims of this conflict of the greatest possible uh, international coalition for peace and justice in the Middle East. Um, before going further, however, President Officer, I wish to draw attention to my membership of the Cross Party Group on Palestine, uh, of which I have previously been an, off an officer, and I thank the current officers, Sandra White, Claudia Beamish, and Jim Hume, for supporting uh, this motion and indeed look forward to their. Uh, contributions to the debate and I would also refer members to my entry on the register of members interests as a former member of the Scottish DUC General Council as I'll make reference to a delegation to Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories uh, which I made while a member. Um, in Scotland just as elsewhere in the world there are a range of views on the solutions to the problems of the Middle East and specifically those of Israel-Palestine. Parliament should reflect those if we wish our voices to be representative of the country and of note to those elsewhere. There are few neutral voices. However, the scale of the current and most recent violence to which we are all bearing witness, and indeed the length of time that this conflict has gone on, have meant that there is a breadth to the voices which say that the current actions of the Israeli government have been disproportionate. There are instances of action which require international investigation, and indeed an international response which goes beyond simply wishing for talks or for different partners in the cause of peace. I am a supporter of a Palestinian state. I believe that a viable state for the Palestinians is their right and that it is the duty of progressive voices around the world to advocate for it with resolution, with realism about the barriers to it and with firmness against those who frustrate the two-state solution on either side, whether in principle or by delay. And I believe that the current violence and the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza is winning new supporters for the cause of justice and peace, not terrorism and not military action. The motion which we are debating condemns the scale of the violence on both sides. I condemn utterly and without caveat the indiscriminate firing of rockets into Israel from Gaza. I condemn tunneling, tunneling into Israeli territory from Gaza and I believe that the fear and danger that they represent serves no purpose other than the prolonging of this conflict which reduces the likelihood that Israelis will question the actions of their government, far less become advocates for engagement with their Palestinian neighbours. Correspondingly, the scale of the horror in Gaza does nothing to bolster the voices of those who recognise that a viable Palestinian state can only be achieved alongside a secure Israel and that it will be created through negotiation of land, not violence against civilians. Peace for one society and normality for individuals and families will not be a lasting if it is achieved only for one group. That is not a justification for violence. It is simply recognition that the underlying uh, issues of this conflict continue. I visited northern Israel in the aftermath of Operation Cast Lead, and like many other international visitors, I have been shown the rockets which come over the border from Gaza. I have spoken to Israelis about their fears of attack, and I have no doubt those fears are genuine. I have also spoken to Palestinians and international observers who have told me of the harsh and brutal reality of life under blockade in Gaza. So the images we now see on our television screens in which people are taking to our streets to protest, they offend the world. 
Schools and hospitals, which the innocent can only hope are places of safety, have become a battlefield which is raging on a strip of land which is one of the most densely populated places on earth. Civilians and children have been killed and injured in their thousands. To those who say we need to step back from condemnation of the disproportion of this uh, violence because it needs to be understood against the wider politics of the region, of the dispute or the history of the peace process. Imagine being born into the world on the Gaza Strip. Imagine the hopelessness of parents as they look at their children and imagine the desperate future that stretches far beyond the tiny horizons which surround them. Others will no doubt in this debate use their time to talk about their reactions to what we are watching. But whilst the agony is more profound perhaps now than it, than it has ever been before, the truth is that much of what we will hear in this debate could have been said in any of the three years since I was elected to this parliament. It was said during the more than 10 years that I've been actively involved in various campaigns and it's been continuously said in the 30 years of my life and for long before. Others will, I hope, touch on the injustices which continue on the West Bank where Hamas are not in control and others will no doubt mention many of the advocates for the Palestinians who have put the case for change in the Middle East better than I ever can, including the late Nelson Mandela, Archbishop Tutu or former President Carter. Yet the truth is that while the world desperately desires a lasting ceasefire to the current violence, the hope, the necessity of a two-state solution is fast disappearing before our very eyes. The situation is desperate, but the world simply cannot allow hope to die with the children of Gaza. Time does not allow me to say all that I would wish to say in this debate, presiding officer, but I would uh, want uh, simply to uh, end this opening contribution as the motion does by urging the Scottish Government to continue their efforts to do all that they can for good community relations here in our country. Members of our minority communities feel the pain of this conflict keenly and they deserve our solidarity just as the innocent civilian victims in the Middle East deserve our resolve in speaking out. When I have asked ordinary Palestinians what it is that Scots can do, what any of us can do as witnesses, I have been told, do not forget us. Do not forget that we exist. When those who, be who believe in a two-state solution speak out, let it not be described as support for terrorism, which is condemned by our citizens and by those around the world who believe that there is no violent solution to the political problem that exists in the occupied territories. When we tell our children what the UN flag represents, let them be proud of it, not compromised by it. I hope that the message that goes out from the Scottish Parliament tonight and from this debate is one of humanity, presiding officer. We see what exists and we recognise that it is unjust. The leaders of the world will continue reflecting on the steps that can be taken internationally, but the citizens of the world are making clear that in our individual actions, we will protest bombardment and terrorism until lasting peace prevails and demands for justice are met. Thank you very much. And I would just, uh, before I call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Sandra White, I would just say we are very tight for time this evening and we will need to extend the debate in due course. So I'm asking for three minute speeches, please, up to three minutes. And if I might ask Patricia Ferguson, firstly, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on the humanitarian disaster that is the unfolding tragedy in Gaza. And I'm sure members across the chamber will join me in thanking our colleague Drew Smith for securing this chance for Parliament to debate this most serious, deadly conflict. According to Amnesty International, since the start of the Israeli military offensive on the 8th of July, 1,948 Palestinians have been killed as a direct result of that offensive. The majority, civilians, over 85%, including 456 children. Three civilians have been killed by rockets or mortars fired from Gaza and 64 Israeli soldiers have been killed. Almost 12,000 homes in Gaza have been reduced to rubble. These are the stark statistics of the bloody and unequal conflict being played out in Gaza, so graphically captured on our television screens. And amongst the destruction rained down in the defenseless civilian population of Gaza, it is the fate of the children that is most heartrending. And I cite the case of one of the hundreds of innocents affected, 10-year-old Mohammed Badran. Mohammed was blinded in an Israeli airstrike, but at the hospital, he seemed to be unaware that his entire family 
had been killed when a missile destroyed their home at the Nizarat refugee camp. Unable to understand the nature of his injury, he repeatedly asked staff why they had switched the lights off. Just one little boy's awful situation left blind and orphaned by an indiscriminate attack of the Israeli Air Force. One terrible consequence of a political decision by the present government in Tel Aviv to wage war not against an opposing army, but against a defenseless, a defenseless rather, civilian population. Not an act of war, presiding officer, but a war crime. For the avoidance of doubt, <laughs> let me be crystal clear. I, along with colleagues, I'm sure across the chamber, hold all human life dear. We mourn for the dead, both Palestinian and Israeli. When we criticise the actions of Israel in Gaza, it is not a condemnation of Jews or Judaism, but a condemnation of the present political establishment in Israel. Of course, the firing of rockets by Hamas must end, but Israel's response goes far beyond defending their borders and their population. The life of a Palestinian child is not worth less than the life of an Israeli child. And the situation is primarily the result of the political actions of the Israeli government. We must do all we can to bring pressure to bear on that government to change a course of action which has such catastrophic consequences for the civilian population of Gaza. There needs to be a negotiated ceasefire which has more permanence than the series of recent 72-hour ceasefires. And the immediate humanitarian effort in Gaza needs to have a real chance to deliver the much needed emergency supplies of food, water and hygiene kits to those in such desperate need. And of course, presiding officer, we mustn't forget the aid agencies who risk life and limb to get that supply to the people who need it. Pressure must be brought on the Israeli to government to, to close, change... Please. I shall do, presiding officer, to change its long-term strategy as regards Gaza and the Palestinian people. And the UK government must not be complicit in breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention. We must agree with the STUC's call for immediate and comprehensive peace talks and a settlement based on international law, including an end to the blockade, illegal settlements and the dismantling of the separation wall. Presiding officer, our own recent history tells us others, that you don't make peace talking to your friends. It's time for all of those involved in this tragedy to engage in proper dialogue and bring to an end this ongoing tragedy. Thank you. I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Three minutes, Thank you very please. much, President Officer. May I declare an interest as a member of the cross-party group on Palestine. I have visited uh, Gaza and uh, the West Bank also. Can I thank Drew Smith for securing this debate and uh, pay tribute to the millions of people throughout the world who marched throughout the world, many of them Jewish, by the way, as well, in support of the people of Gaza and against the killing of innocent civilians by Israel. Presiding officer has already been said by Patricia Ferguson, the death toll of Palestinian, Palestinians killed in Operation Protective Edge is 1,948 and rising daily. Most of them are civilians. We are now facing a huge humanitarian crisis with areas completely destroyed and homes uninhabitable. In fact, the UN has said the level of destruction is unprecedented, anything they've ever seen before. Schools, hospitals, UN shelters, all destroyed. No power, no water, raw sewage flowing in the streets. And all because of the indiscriminate attack by the Israelis. The suffering of the Palestinian people must stop. The people of Gaza have been left with nothing. One quote I saw was from a gentleman who was left with just the clothes he stood on, but what he stood in. But what he said was, thanks to Allah, I have my six children. All he had was his six children, no wife, and the clothes that he stood up in. They've nothing left apart from their pride and their great resilience. And I really admire them for that resilience. But you know, admiration isn't enough. Action is needed. I know that the Disaster Emergency Committee have launched an appeal and a fund which is to be most welcomed. And I thank the Scottish Government for the actions on medical aid and calls for an arms embargo on Israel. That's the action that I want to see. But I would like to raise something else with the Minister. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister if there's anything more we can do in the Scottish Government. 
And I am thinking of the Procurement Reform Bill, which was recently passed by the Scottish Parliament, and there is statutory guidance is being looked at. And I, could, I asked the Minister if, during the procurement process, could they possibly look at products, services or businesses from land that is internationally recognised as illegally occupied? Could that be considered in the procurement bill? As Res Resolution 446 of the U UN Security Council determines. Presiding officer, much has been said and will be said about the situation in Gaza. Drew Smith's absolutely right. This is the third horrific attack on the Gazans and the Palestinian people. A prison camp, Gaza is a prison camp. And the people of Gaza deserve our support and the people of Palestine deserve their state. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And thank you. And I now call on Claudia Beamish to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Can I thank Drew Smith for getting this debate so quickly? And I strongly support the motion, which I discussed with Drew before its drafting. Can I declare an interest as a co-convener of the cross-party group for Palestine, where we all work together in any small way that we can? Can I also apologise to the Chamber if I have to leave before the end of this debate, because I'm hosting an event in the garden lobby? The immediate response of the appeals, um, and trade, both trade union and UK-wide, and other appeals across the world, along with demonstrations across Scotland and Britain, and the flying of flags over many council buildings, and the calls for arms embargoes on Israel, which I support, show the grave concern and solidarity of so many of our people here with the people of Palestine. With the opportunity of the Minister being here to answer the debate, I want to highlight the immediate need for medical aid and recognise the initial commitment of the Scottish Government to this and urge the Scottish Government to do more. Specifically, can the Minister clarify how well is this NHS initiative to be resourced and does the funding include the cost of transfer of patients? And will acutely ill children requiring life support be transferred out or will only stable elective patients? As part of the Council for European-Palestinian Relations, uh, John Finney and I went on a parliamentary delegation uh, after Operation uh, Pillar of Defence, as it is called in Israel. On arrival, joining a vigil with a family whose home had been destroyed was only the start of wit witnessing the disproportionate results of attacks by the Israeli military. While there, we visited a UN school where children were grateful for our Scottish Parliament pencils, which they did not have when we gave them to a class. They live, most of them, on UN handouts of food and clean water too. The ch these children whose future is now on hold and has been for generations... It is those who grow up under this state of siege and are exposed to the recent bombardment whom we must be saddened for most. And of course, as I've already said, this is not the first generation. This has been going on for 60 years. I want to highlight the issue of long-term mental health challenges in the Gaza Strip and some of the psychological problems faced by the besieged population. Just last week, research into trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety and coping strategies among Palestinian adolescents was, was uh, written about in the Arab Journal of Psychiatry. Facing with others in Gaza the shocking imprisonment, which we've heard of from other members, in the most densely populated place in the world, the deplorable cycle of violence and coping against the odds from day to day in between assaults, is it any wonder that many people, and young people particularly, become radicalised? The lifting of the blockade must be an essential part of negotiations. Pat Chien, member now of the Northern Ireland Assembly, who was a political prisoner and hunger striker in Northern Ireland and was the leader of our delegation to Gaza, stressed then in 2012 to the world's press who were assembled to listen to us in Gaza that Hamas must be part of the negotiations going forward. I'm sure he is right. I hope we can send a collective message today from this chamber only a political solution which involves a Palestinian state while ensuring Israel's own citizen security can be a solution please. which will hold firm and bring a chance of life and hope to the children and young people of Gaza and those of the Palestinian exiles around the world. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now Colin Murdo Fraser to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I um, congratulate uh, Drew Smith on securing this debate and commend him for the... Uh, uh, balanced and fair tone, both of his motion and of his opening contribution. Uh, I think our overriding concern must be for the innocent civilians caught, caught up in this strife. And as we've heard in the debate, the civilian suffering, especially that of the children involved, is appalling and tragic. 
The Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, has rightly called the current situation in Gaza and Israel a humanitarian catastrophe. And given the rapidly deteriorating situation, the UK International Development Secretary has made around £12 million available in emergency support, including health care, clean water, blankets and cooking equipment to help the people affected by the violence in Gaza. DFID is also bringing forward £3 million in funding to help the International Committee of the Red Cross respond to the worsening situation. And this is in the context of wider support from DFID, who over the past four years have provided a total of £349 million to support Palestinian development, of which £30 million a year goes directly to help the people of Gaza uh, and also to help develop Palestinian institutions and the economy so that a future Palestinian state can be stable, prosperous and live side by side in peace and security uh, with Israel. I think in looking at the conflict, we need to remember the victims are not just in Gaza. There are victims in Gaza and in Israel. And Gazan civilians are not the only casualties uh, in the recent spate of rocket attacks. The Israelis are also living with the consequences of the ongoing conflict. And the Israeli Defence Forces estimate that 5 million Israeli civilians live within range of rockets fired from Gaza. I think the danger in playing the blame game is that it suggests the fault is all on one side. And I don't, do not believe that is the case. I do agree that Israel's response has been disproportionate. But let's not be in any doubt, Deputy Presiding Officer, Hamas is a terrorist organisation, one vilified by most of the Arab world. And while the retaliatory action taken by Israel has had devastating effects on innocent civilians, we cannot ignore the fact that Hamas have been using its own people as human shields and sacrifices to justify firing rockets at Israeli civilians and to increase its own civilian casualties in order to turn Western opinion against Israel. And indeed, they have broken two ceasefires to date. Hamas is putting Gazans in harm's way by using UN schools and hospitals to store rockets and launch attacks. I think all of us in this chamber want to see an end to the death of innocents. And we should rightly put pressure on the Israeli government for their actions. But we should not be naive enough to simply place all the blame at the door of Israel when Hamas's aim is to destroy Israel and kill each and every Jew. Presiding officer, our concern should be for the innocents who suffer on all sides, and we should devote all our efforts to assisting them and finding a peaceful, lasting settlement in this troubled part of the world. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Jean Urquhart. I condemn the firing of Hamas rockets into Israel, but I think it's simply a fact to say that the greatest recruiting sergeant for Hamas is the scale of Israeli oppression and aggression. I think the least that can be said about that aggression uh, is that it's disproportionate when we consider nearly 2,000 Palestinian civilians and uh, of single numbers of Israeli uh, civilians. But when I see and when we see the images of young children and families and uh, people of all ages being maimed who are totally innocent, and when we see this, the kind of weapons that are being used, such as flechette shells that splinter into a thousand tiny lethal metal darts in the skin of children and others, then I, like others, am forced to use language such as obscene, grotesque, indiscriminate, and in many cases uh, illegal. I think some of the strongest condemnation of the massacre we have seen has come from Jews themselves. And I think of Gerald Kaufman's words in the House of Commons when he said his Jewish grandmother wasn't shot to provide cover for uh, Israelis to murder grandmothers in Gaza. And also the American Jew Naomi Wolf who said that she mourned, and it's her word, she mourned the genocide in Gaza. So what now? Of course, we need a ceasefire, but not just a ceasefire, but a new deal for Gaza, a new deal for Palestine, based on the two-state solution for both Israel and Palestine have a right to a secure future. A starting point must be a commitment to lift the blockade on Gaza. Following this, there must be a firm promise to cease illegal settlements building, which makes a mockery of the 1949 armistice lines. 
The motion points to the destruction of infrastructure over the course of the conflict. We must uh, aid the rebuilding uh, of that infrastructure uh, and also, of course, the importation of vital humanitarian support, as Drew Smith points out in his motion. Another point, and I think the Scottish Government has said that it will give assistance with regard uh, to uh, the health area, but I would ask the Minister in his summing up to tell us where that commitment has got to, because I know concerns have expressed to me that it's taking too long to help uh, those in, that we can help uh, in terms of their health. So I hope that it may be possible for the Scottish Government to speed up the process and help as many of the severely injured as possible. Finally, however, I support a full arms embargo as a means of building pressure towards uh, peace. I also support the use of the boycotting of goods as a means to exert economic pressure. This is necessary not only to show in our practical way our disgust at the conduct of the Israeli Defence Force and the administration, but also to pressurise the Israeli government to open channels of engagement with the Palestinians with a view to a just two-state solution. Thank you very much. I now call on Jean Urquhart to be followed by Jim Hume. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Drew Smith for securing this debate and also uh, to thank the 17 members who signed my motion on the crisis calling for the use of divestment and sanctions to pressure Israel to bring its illegal occupation of both Gaza and the West Bank to an end. Um, I should also declare an interest as a member of the cross-party group on Palestine. But another important step towards justice for Palestine is the international recognition of its existence as a sovereign nation. Two years ago, the United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to recognise Palestine as a non-member observer state. And I was proud that the Scottish government made clear at that time that had we had a vote, Scotland would have voted, like other countries, to recognise Palestine. Instead, uh, Scots are represented, and I use that word reluctantly, by a Westminster government that put obedience to the White House ahead of that. During this offensive, the Scottish Government has rightly announced that we are ready and willing to welcome refugees from Gaza and in line with our values and our international duty. But Scotland stands in the invidious position of having to beg permission to show human compassion. The Minister for External Affairs could only write to the Home Secretary and my understanding is that after nearly a month that letter has gone unanswered. I'm really proud that this debate has so many wishing to speak, and the compassion and commitment of members across the Parliament can't be faulted. But I do highlight that the reality is that Scotland's 21st century internationalist values count for little as long as we are represented in the world by a distant Whitehall government with quite different values. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Christine Graham. Yeah, thank you. I also congratulate Drew Smith on this motion. This Parliament has a history of action, really, the situation in the Gaza Strip. Robert Burns had it right when he wrote, Man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. And I think we all mourn for those affected in the Middle East today, not just here, but, uh, of course, across the world. We're in the middle of commemorating the centenary of the war to end all wars, the First World War. How I wish that had been true, that it had ended all wars, but sadly it has not. We have many conflicts now, airliners shot down in, in Europe, our own continent, and the ongoing fighting there. Of course, the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Iraq and again trouble in Gaza and Palestine. As another of the co-conveners on the cross-party group on Palestine, I have visited Gaza, Palestine and Israel. I have witnessed the difficulties in an area of the small size of Gaza with over one and a half million inhabitants. The essentials of life, water, medicine, food, fuel and power before this recent tra tragedy were at a critical level. They are now beyond critical. The Egyptian situation has seen the only way in and out of Gaza at the Rafah Gate, now nearly impossible to get through. Fishing boats heavily restricted through the distance they can fish from the Gaza coast and their export market non-existent. What I was struck with, amongst many things, was the resilience of the Palestinians, the way they look forward to a better time. I say they have suffered too much and for too long. Their hope is fading and their right to live peacefully as a civilised nation, as fellow humans, is here and now. There have been countless UN resolutions supported by the UK Government, re-Palestine and Gaza, 
It is time for a two-state solution, as others have stated and recommend, as recommended by the UN. Thousands have died, countless homeless, in a land of no real opportunity uh, due to the siege. The current situation is appalling. I hope for the ceasefire to hold and that holders of power and influence look to areas like India, South Africa and even Ireland to see that the only way forward is a peaceful solution. Today we had the great Mandela's granddaughter take time for reflection. Perhaps we should remember his peaceful actions and some of his words in a quote, to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. We need respect for the people of Palestine and Gaza to live their lives in a peaceful manner with pride and hope for the future. We need to lay down your arms and embrace humanity. Mandela also said, and I quote, it all, always seems impossible until it's done. The, Pal the Palestinians have been on their long walk to freedom. Let's end that walk and let's end the siege of Gaza. Thank you very much. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I congratulate the member on securing this debate. And I'll start by stating that I consider that Israel has been guilty by its bombing of civilians, hardly avoidable in this crowded area, but in particular of bombs landing on UN safe houses, despite repeated information from the UN, guilty of war crimes, and a matter for the International Criminal Court, which I raised last week at Topical Questions. Tonight, however, I want to focus on that other war, the war taking place in the media. There is no doubt that anyone with a mobile phone taking footage with correspondence on the ground giving 24-hour coverage, world opinion can switch literally at the click of a switch. So we are shocked and upset by the images of three wee boys killed in a beach as they run from gunfire, of a weeping parent committing a young life to an early grave, or of an old lady trapped in the ruins of her home. So what is said by representatives of those who cause these civilian deaths and horrific images, and I'll focus in this debate on the language of Israeli high command, has to combat the mantra, a picture is worth a thousand words. So we have phrases like protective edge instead of invasion of another's territory. Call the defence system iron dome machismo. When a soldier is captured invading another's territory, call it kidnapping or abducted. And at the same time, let that story, let those words hide the truth that he was killed in combat. We've been here before with shock and awe, and look where that took us and the mess and continuing mess in Iraq. None of this happens by accident. Spokesmen and women are media trained and trained by experts. Spin in itself is a spin of what we used to call propaganda, but that's not such an acceptable term. So step forward, Dr. Franz Luce, expert Republic pollster and political strategist, and his study commissioned by a group called Israeli Project. Put short, it's a do's and don'ts for Israeli spokesmen. Americans agree, for instance, that Israel has a right to defensible borders, but don't just say what those borders are, and certainly not in terms of pre and post-1967. But much of his advice is about tone and presentation of the Israeli case. He says it's absolutely crucial to exude sympathy for the Palestinians. In particular, use the soundbite, quote, I particularly want to reach out to Palestinian mothers who have lost their children. No parent should have to bury a child. A picture, however, is worth a thousand words, spun or unspun. Today, I have the images of blood-spattered children and exhausted surgeons in a bombed hospital, and another of a row of Israelis perched on a sofa with drinks in hand at a vantage point, all the better to view the bombing of Gaza. You can't spin those. Thank you very much. And before we continue the debate, I know there are still a number of members wishing to speak in this debate. And with this in mind, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr Smith, would you please move the motion? So, it's so moved. Thank you officer. very much. And so the question is, therefore, that under Rule 8.14.3, the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? We are. Thank you. And I now call Alex Rowley to be followed by Jim Eadie.
thank you, President Officer, and I would also um, thank Drew Smith for, for securing this debate tonight, and I would also um, acknowledge and thank the Scottish Government for the actions that they have taken today on this issue. I think in order to achieve a two-state solution, there has to be a political will um, in, in Gaza and in Israel, and I'm not sure that that political will exists at the present time, and that's why I think it is important that this Parliament and parliaments across Europe have these discussions, have these debates, and look at how we can bring in Europe together, use Europe uh, to be able to put the types of pressure on that need to be put on to bring about a long-term sustainable solution to what is an unacceptable uh, situation that's, that's been ongoing for some 40-odd years. Um, I would want to condemn the, um, the rockets that, that come out of Gaza um, aimed at Israel. I would want to also condemn the bombs, the bullets and the missiles that are raining down on innocent men, women and children in Gaza. And I think we need to speak out very loudly. The um, Save the Children sent us out a briefing and it's worth I think, reiterating the point that they make, 456 Palestinian children have lost their lives in this current uh, conflict. Over two-thirds are 12 years old or younger. Where else, where else in the world would this be happening where you have a government that, that is indiscriminately killing innocent children and it would be allowed to happen? And that's why it's so important that this parliament speaks out, because we've got to, regardless of the rights and the wrongs, the political conflict that's there, it could be never right, never right, any place in the world for children to be killed in this way that we have been seeing on our television sets. So we have to send that message and send that message loudly and clearly and I hope that parliaments across Europe will look at how we can start to come together to actually do something to try and bring a stop to a situation that's unacceptable. We also need to look at removing any arms licences that, that are granted to British companies because we should be making clear not in our name, not a, a, a missile, not a bomb, not a bullet, that's been produced in this country will be used in this type of conflict by the Israeli government. And we've got to take that action. Um, the Amnesty International pointed that last year the UK sold £6.3 million worth of arms to Israel. Not in our name. We've got to be calling unitedly from this parliament to stop that. And finally, presiding officer, we also need to look at the UN investigating whether war crimes have taken place in Gaza on either side. And we've got to be calling for that investigation. And if it is shown to be the case that war crimes have taken place, then we need to take and support the UN to take the, the necessary action to bring those who have committed these war crimes to justice. It cannot be right in any country any place in the world. And if it was happening any place in the world, we would be speaking out. And if we allow this to happen and allow this to continue, then the world will be a much worse place. So I hope that we do unite together, we do see the strengths that we can have through Europe and work together to bring an end to this. I now call on Jimmy D to be followed by Neil Finlay. I too congratulate Drew Smith for securing this important debate which allows the Parliament of Scotland to debate the situation facing the people of Gaza and I thank all of my colleagues from across the chamber for their thoughtful contributions this evening. Presiding officer, there is a growing mood of despair within the Muslim community in this country and throughout the Middle East at what is perceived to be the West's indifference towards the plight of the Palestinians. It was a Singapore academic, Kishori Mabubani, who put it bluntly when he stated, in the Western moral calculus, the loss of Muslim lives is unimportant. That perception should concern us, each and every one of us, as we look on in horror at the events in Gaza. And that perception will have been reinforced in recent weeks as we have seen the death toll rise inexorably. 
Western governments have united in condemnation of Israel's actions, but the US and UK governments are complicit in the conflict through their supply of arms to Israel. And that is why we should all endorse the calls from the Scottish Government and the, the uh, NGOs for an arms embargo and the immediate suspension of the sale of arms to Israel. The people of Gaza are facing, as we have heard this evening, a major humanitarian disaster and a critical public health crisis due to the destruction and contamination of Gaza's water supply. International aid agencies like Mercy Corps, whose European headquarters is based in my constituency, are attempting to provide humanitarian assistance in an environment where the water infrastructure has been destroyed. The people of Gaza are prevented from cooking, flushing toilets or washing hands. With water running out, the threat of disease is a very real one. But we do need to put these events into their proper historical context. As one of the foremost experts on the Israel-Palestine conflict, Avi Shleim, has said in relation to the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza post-1967, the aim was to establish Greater Israel through permanent political, economic and military control over the Palestinian territories. And the result has been one of the most prolonged and brutal military occupations of modern times. I do not question Israel's right to live in peace and security with its neighbours, and like others, I condemn unequivocally the rocket attacks by Hamas fired from Gaza into Israel. However, what we have seen is a disproportionate use of force by Israel, resulting in the loss of civilian lives, especially children, 456 of whom have died, as Patricia Ferguson and Alec Rowley reminded us. We have seen the likely breach of Article 58 of the Geneva Convention, which states that parties to conflict should, and I quote, avoid locating military objectives within or near densely populated areas. We have also seen probable breaches in relation to Article 12, the protection of medical units, Article 15, the protection of civilian, medical and religious personnel, and Article 54 on the starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. Article 54 states, and I quote, it is prohibited to attack, destroy or render useless objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population, including drinking water, installations and supplies. A constituent of mine told me at the demonstration outside the Parliament last week that she longs for peace, but there can be no peace without justice. That is why it is so important that there is a United Nations independent investigation into possible war crimes on both sides of the conflict, closed, breaches please. of the Geneva Convention and breaches of international law. We must have that investigation and we must have justice for the people of Gaza and Palestine. Thanks very much. I now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thanks, President Officer. Can I thank Drew Smith for securing the debate and put on record my support for the actions of the Scottish Government today and my membership of the Cross Party Group. Um, like many have watched the horror of Gaza unfold on our TV screens as air airstrikes descended on a small stretch of land not bigger than the distance between this chamber and my house in West Lothian. And I found it almost impossible to comprehend the damage uh, being caused in an area that hosts a population almost a third of the size of Scotland. And, the, and just the justification for their actions, the Israelis say they want to destroy supply tunnels, yet we see the bombing of schools, hospitals and people's homes and businesses. The world is told that Israel wants to defend itself against people they call terrorists, yet we read reports of Israeli aircraft bombing, water wells, sanitation systems and power plants. These are acts of terrorism too. This is a humanitarian disaster unfolding in front of our eyes, and yet the world appears unwilling to tackle the aggression being meted out by the Netanyahu regime. And, President Officer, as Patricia Ferguson said, the life of a Palestinian child is worth no less than the life of an Israeli child, and for each of us with children, no less than one of the, uh, the life of one of our children too. With a tentative ceasefire currently in operation as indirect talks continue, the international community must be allowed to offer immediate support to alleviate suffering. And I condemn outright the actions of the Israeli government and violence from all sides. I condemn the indiscriminate and deliberate bombing of civilians and acts that many believe constitute war crimes and breaches of UN resolutions, as, uh, as Jimmy Day very eloquently explained. I condemn the failure to allow medical supplies, food aid and water through, and I support calls for an arms embargo. You cannot bomb your way to a political solution. And ultimately, the underlying cause of the crisis is political failure, the failure 
over decades to address the occupation of the West Bank, to address the ongoing settlement policy, to address the continued sanctions and to address the blockade of the territory. Only when the Palestinian people are able to live and work and be supported to end poverty that is forced upon them in what is described as the largest open-air prison in the, world, in the world, can they begin to rebuild their lives in peace with their neighbours. And political pressure must come now on a state that permanently flouts UN resolutions, ignores pleas from humanitarian organisations, commits war crimes and disregards the lives of millions held in a small part of, captive in a small part of their homeland. As Drew Smith states, uh, motion states, there is growing recognition that lasting peace cannot come from more violence and only through the creation of a, valid, valid, uh, a viable Palestinian state and a secure Israel. Uh, in closing, President Officer, I want to share uh, the views of other members in the hope that current talks can lead to a sustained ceasefire and that will restart the process of building lasting peace. And I hope that the next time we come to debate Israel and Palestine in this chamber is to welcome a fully recognised Palest Palestinian state free from a block, economic blockade and illegal settlements. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Alison Johnson to be followed by Cara Hilton. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Greens across Europe and the world continue to call for a sustained and secure ceasefire in Gaza and for negotiations by Israel and Hamas with a renew renewed commitment to ongoing peace. I welcome the Scottish Government's support for an arms embargo on Israel and the stronger line of support for the Palestinian people taken by Scottish ministers. I would ask the Minister to ensure continue to strive to ensure that the UK government are fully aware of the urgent need for such an embargo and of a newspaper report at the weekend reporting the Israeli use of Scots-made laser guidance systems in this conflict. I believe that we can put pressure on the Israeli state through a targeted boycott and disinvestment campaign and we can join the efforts of the international community to pursue a lasting peace Along with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the South African activist who fought to end apartheid, we can join a worldwide campaign calling on corporations profiting from Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories to pull out their funding. By putting economic pressure on the Israeli government, Scotland and the UK could play a part in the international effort to control the situation. Speaking at Saturday's rally in Edinburgh, it was clear that the strength of this feeling amongst the general public on this issue and communities across Scotland is growing. But this is not surprising. 1.8 million people live in an area of 140 square miles big. It's one of the most densely populated parts of the globe. And the humanitarian crisis is deepening. 200,000 people have been displaced, some 65,000 homes destroyed. Where will these people return? The average Palestinian is only 17 years old, so it's no surprise that the UNICEF have reported that 400,000 children need immediate psychological help to overcome the trauma they've experienced during the Israeli onslaught. Pernil Ironside, the head of the UNICEF office in Gaza, also warned that children are at risk of contacting, contracting communicable diseases due to the lack of power and sanitation in the blockaded Palestinian territory. Gazans have been left without clean water for weeks now. The Church of Scotland World Mission Report Invest in Peace says, as a form of collective punishment, Israel's illegal blockade of Gaza is a violation of international law. And yet it continues, we must ensure that international law and international humanitarian law are applied. The blockade and entirely disproportionate military bombardment has led to the destruction that we see and can hardly contemplate. The destruction of industry, fishing rights are massively restricted, farming is dangerous and challenging, schools and hospitals, places that should have been sanctuaries, have been hit. And I too support calls for action with regards to procurement. Companies should not benefit through public contracts from the Israeli blockade of Gaza. I would ask to um, the Minister, concerns have been expressed by constituents regarding delays in evacuating Should patients. Your clothes, please. And I'd be grateful if the Minister could advise what action is being taken to establish a recognised transfer and treatment protocol that will save as many lives as possible. Um, in closing, presiding officer, however distant a prospect achieving peace and justice might be, we have to continue to work to achieve this goal because a just peace in Israel and Palestine could be the catalyst for achieving wider peace in the region and indeed across the world. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by John Mason.
Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to Drew Smith for securing this timely debate. Can I start by declaring my interest as a member of the Cross Party Group in Palestine and also a member of the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign? Uh, five months ago in this chamber, we debated the Thurston for Justice campaign concerning water shortages in Gaza. In my speech then, I talked about how the Israeli government had condemned a whole generation of children to a future that is bleak at the very best. Five months on, and for many of those children, that bleak future is no future at all. Many families have been literally torn apart or wiped out entirely. And Patricia Ferguson's example that she highlighted certainly brought tears to my eyes. Because we've seen 456 children who have been killed, thousands more who have been injured, 400,000 that have received that are facing psychological damage, children who thought they were safe when they sheltered in a UN school, whose lives were tragically cut short when they were killed in their sleep by Israeli missiles. 17 times the UN warned that this was a UN shelter, yet still the Israeli military carried on with a shameful act of terror. And despite the outcry, even from the USA, we've seen a further five UN shelters targeted by the Israeli military. From the children playing on the foot football on the beach shot at by Israeli gunships, to the children playing in the swings at the play park killed by Israeli gunfire, to the children who have seen everyone that they love wiped out. This is an assault in which the innocent children of Gaza are caught up in a nightmare that they simply can't escape. I condemn the violence on all sides, but this certainly isn't a conflict with any balance. This is about a brutal Israeli government that is in breach of countless UN resolutions, that's illegally occupying Palestinian land, that's continuing to bulldoze Palestinian homes, and that for seven years has blockaded the people of Gaza in on all sides, denying them access to clean water, to medical supplies, to human rights, denying children the right even to a childhood. I was pleased to join 700 people in Kirkcaldy recently who marched in solidarity with families in Gaza. And I'm proud too that Fife Council this week is flying the Palestinian flag in solidarity with those families in Gaza who are under attack. Because enough is enough. This isn't about taking sides. This is about humanity. As consumers too, we've got power. And when we do our supermarket shop, we should be using that power to boycott Israeli goods. In any case, why should we buy Israeli potatoes when we can buy perfectly good Scottish potatoes from down the road from here in the UK? Just as consumer power played a huge role in ending the apartheid regime in South Africa, we too can bring about change in Palestine. It's also time for the UK government to end its virtual silence and use its economic influence to tell Israel that enough is enough. As Alec Rowley highlighted, £6.3 million of arms were sold to Israel by the UK this year, and the revelation that military equipment made in Fife has possibly been used against children in Gaza was certainly a shock to me as a Fife MSP. No company in Fife, Scotland or elsewhere in the UK should be supplying the brutal Israeli government with any arms or military equipment. So we need an arms embargo and we need an investigation into why our factories are supplying a country which shows absolutely no respect for international law, for human rights and for the rights of children. And we also need a solution that ends not just the current violence but secures justice for the Palestinian people, an end to Israel's illegal siege in Gaza and an end to the illegal occupation of Palestinian land. And for those who have committed shameful acts of terror, such as the bombing of schools and hospitals, to be held for, uh, to account for the war crimes that they have committed. As Nelson Mandela said, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And it's time for Scotland and the UK to use their influence to, to secure justice and freedom for the Palestinian people. Thank you very much. And now call on John Mason to be followed by Sarah Boy. Three minutes, if you can manage. Okay, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I thank Drew Smith as well for bringing this subject to the Chamber. Presiding Officer, I think we need to think about what our aim is in this situation. Do we want to choose one side or the other and shout loudly for it? Or do we want to try and reduce the tension in the Middle East and try to be peacemakers, building relationships with both sides? Because if we want to be peacemakers, sanctions or a boycott of one party will not move us in that direction, nor will flying a flag from Glasgow City Chambers. Now, what is the situation between Israel and Palestine? Israel has some 8 million people, Palestine only 4 million. So Israel is much bigger. Israel spends 18 billion on its defences, Palestine clearly next to nothing. So on the surface of it, Israel looks like the big strong country, while Palestine or Gaza is the smaller weaker one. And the casualties clearly are far greater on the Palestinian side. So on the surface, we should all support Palestine. But is it as simple as that? On population, Israel may have 8 million, 
but is dwarfed by other larger players in the region, including Egypt at 82 million and Iran at 77 million. Again, on defence spending, Israel has 18 billion, but Saudi Arabia has 59 billion. So it can also be seen that Israel is a pretty small country and it does feel threatened by its larger neighbours. On human rights, we look at the International Human Rights Rank Indicator. It ranks Syria at 211th, Saudi Arabia at 205th, Iran at 166th, Palestine at 107th, and Israel at 71st. No, I'm sorry, I haven't time. Now, 71st may not be great, but it is better than a number of other countries. Are we looking at sanctions or boycotts of every state where human rights is worse than 71st in the world? Or is it just Israel that is the target of our criticism? Is there a danger that we change the balance in the region by stopping supplying Israel while still supplying other countries? Now, I think we can and should be ready to challenge any country when it does wrong. Even in the Bible, God is severely critical of his people, the Jews, when they go off track. So we should not blindly support any one country, even our own, but at the same time, we should not blindly oppose any one country. All I'm asking here is, are we being consistent in the standards we are setting for Israel and for other countries? We have many claims and counterclaims in this situation. Hamas and others accuse Israel of indiscriminate bombing. Israel accuses Hamas of deliberately firing rockets from civilian sites and deliberately encouraging civilians to gather round targets. Many want to see the blockade lifted and more cement allowed in. Israel says that cement is used for the Hamas war effort. I do not think any of us here today have the means or ability to weigh up all of these claims and counterclaims right now. But I think what we can do is send out a strong message supporting a ceasefire, doing all we can to build up relationships with all parties and do our utmost to encourage serious peace talks. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Sarah Bayot to be followed by Colin Keir. Well, I want to join colleagues in thanking Drew Smith for enabling us to have this debate tonight. And in, in a sense, I just want to follow on from the points made by John Mason. I don't think colleagues in the chamber are setting out either to be for or against Israel or for or against Palestine. As actually quite a few members have said, people support the two-state solution. Now, that means Palestine and Israel sitting side by side as neighbours, trading, respecting each other's borders. And the challenge is that we are as far away from that solution as we have ever been. I visited Gaza 30 years ago on a United Nations youth visit, and some of the young people I mentioned then, met, met, uh, met then, will now be mothers and fathers of the children that Claudia Beamish talked about, who are experiencing extreme psychological damage. The contrast between those UNRWA schools, which were um, dynamic, happy places, places of learning, and the schools that you see in your television screens now could not be more complete. And I think it says it everything when experienced journalists, experienced United Nations officials find it difficult to compose themselves on the television. What we are seeing is unimaginable to us for one and a half million people not to have access regularly to drinking water, for there to be no power supplies, for there to be uh, bombing that's almost daily. It's just impossible for us to imagine. The unemployment statistics for Gaza, for young people, it's 58%. 58% of young people are unemployed. 52% of women are unemployed and 37% of men. So those families have absolutely no scope for income. So in thinking about what we do, we have to see humanitarian support and the work of the aid agencies is absolutely heroic. When you see what they are all dealing with, it's heroic. We need to do as much as we can as individuals, as political representatives and as members of our communities to support that fantastic and vital humanitarian work. But we need to demand a political solution. The two-state solution requires the two sides to sit and talk to each other. They don't like each other. We know that. We're in a conflict situation. But as people have mentioned before, you don't get peace without the parties to the conflict sitting down, being prepared to work together. And in this circumstance, the parties will not choose to do that. The parties have to be brought to the negotiating table by world, a world determined to make them do that. Economic power will help that. Sustained political pressure will help that, and we tonight can add our pressure to that process. We can, through our procurement work, whether it's 
choosing to buy Palestinian goods where they are still being produced. Um, and as citizens, we can do that as well. We can look to the fair trade movement, shops like Hadil that are still sourcing um, goods being made by Palestinians, whether it's olive oil or whether it's embroidery. That's a practical step we can take. But the bigger picture is, as others have said, the economic and political power. We must use that power because this conflict has been going on for decades. And unlike all the other situations we could talk about, um, close, please? South Africa most, most probably prominently, where it's not, there's progress, things are not perfect, but there is progress. Palestine has actually gone back and Gaza is appalling. And we, we cannot stand for that and we must do everything we can to add our voices for a two-state solution and to demand that Israel and the Palestinians sit together. And in fact, has a, in fact Fa, um, Fatah and Hamas in April agreed a solution whereby the Palestinian Authority would work together in Gaza. That surely is a first step forward and we must make sure that that actually happens. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Colin Keir to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, may I add my congratulations to Drew Smith for bringing forward this very important debate. Our TV screens are currently dominated by highly disturbing images uh, from Gaza. And as Drew Smith pointed out, Hamas is certainly not blameless in this conflict, and I would condemn their rocket attacks. However, the effect of Israel's Operation Protective Edge has shown how abhorrent and indiscriminate warfare can become. Amnesty International claims that war crimes have been committed by both sides, but the hammer that is the Israeli military offensive is so scattergun in its approach that the effects are a shock to any person watching TV or reading media reports. Indeed, some of the images seen on social media are so harrowing they just couldn't be televised. And we keep on being told that we live in an age where warfare is computerised and targeted. And this is what makes the bombing of UN schools or youngsters on a beach playing football all the more disgusting. It's been pointed out by others this isn't the first time that Israel has carried out this type of offensive. And there is absolutely no moral justification for these actions. If this was a moral war, it's clear most of the world believe Israel is losing. Indiscriminate violence against those who cannot defend themselves is simply not acceptable in a modern world. And I support the Scottish Government in its calls for a UN investigation to be held, as well as the offer of financial and medical assistance. It will also be interesting to see if there is a mechanism which may allow the International Criminal Court to play a part in future. The briefing today given by Save the Children gives stark figures. One in four Palestinians killed in this conflict are children. Schools and hospitals are damaged or destroyed and shelter is now required for around 300,000 people. Infrastructure development has to happen. This isn't easy at the best of times, but it's impossible with missiles falling from the sky. Robert Turner of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine said, if we want to build something, we have to submit a detailed project proposal to Israel with the design location and complete build of quantities. The Israelis then review the proposal, a process that is supposed to take not more than two months, but on average takes nearly 20. It's an absolutely silly situation to be in. International pressure really must be put on Israel to lift the blockade and to work tirelessly towards the two-state solution. Finally, the UK government must make a stand. Arms sales to and from the UK must stop along with reciprocal military training arrangements. Not to do so would make the UK look as morally bankrupt as those who destroy innocent lives in Gaza and beyond. Thanks so much. I now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank Drew Smith for the opportunity to take part in this debate. I don't often speak on issues of foreign affairs, but I want to make a specific and domestically focused contribution to our discussion. There is no doubt that the recent violence in Israel and Gaza has touched many people here in Scotland, and it is difficult, if not impossible, not to be moved by the suffering we have witnessed. It is a conflict which not only reflects deep divisions in the Middle East, it often polarises opinion in this country too, and I have been contacted by constituents with strong feelings on both sides of that divide, both primarily motivated by their own humanity. 
although I would wish our response here in Scotland to be measured and respectful at all times. Many local residents have contacted me to say how upset and hurt they have been at the imbalance and the one-sided nature of much of that coverage and response. Presenting officer, as members will know, there is a sizable and long-established Jewish community in my constituency, and many local residents have family members living in Israel. And as you might imagine, they are more aware than most uh, of the suffering and the violence that ensues in that part of the world. Jewish Scots are directly affected every time tensions rise in the Middle East. Several local people have told me of the abuse that they receive and of their fear simply to go out in public wearing a kippah or anything else that marks them out as visibly Jewish. Parents and grandparents with children at Calderwood Lodge Primary School have expressed their anxiety at their pupils' security and their well-being. Now, everyone has the right to protest and to express their views, but the Jewish community in the West of Scotland are feeling increasingly let down at a time when they are already feeling vulnerable. I have received many letters and calls on this issue, but I want to quote from one which I believe captures much of that sense of upset and dismay. And it's from a woman who is particularly concerned and anxious at the decision by Glasgow City Council to fly the Palestinian flag. And she says, as a Scottish and Jewish citizen, I feel this decision sends a strong message to the wider community and will, I fear, not be the one that is intended by the Council. If the Scottish political establishment wish to express hope for peace in the region, then they should be opting to fly more than one flag as a symbol of recognition of all parties affected by conflicts in that area. And she goes on, I am highly sympathetic of the high Palestinian population's right to a two-state solution and to self-governance, and indeed feel that such a solution is paramount. But the current situation whereby anti-Israel sentiment is allowing anti-Semitic behaviour to come to the fore across Europe is frankly highly disturbing. The decisions of Scottish councils to use a demonstrative action as a means of promoting peace will, I fear, promote further community division and potentially incite hatred. And she signs herself a frightened mother of two children. Presenting officer, I believe we do want to send out a message emphasising our common humanity, but I am particularly grateful to Drew Smith for recognising the need for balance in his own contribution on this emotive and painful issue. Thank you very much. And I now call on John Finney to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. I too thank uh, Drew Smith for encouraging this debate and indeed the well-crafted motion that others have referred to. I should declare my membership of the cross-party group and also of Amnesty and Oxfam, whom I thank along with others for the briefings. What the whole affair has cried out for is honours brokers and organisations like that have uh, uh, provided that. Now, there's a, a phrase, there's a couple of phrases that have been repeated uh, throughout this uh, discussion, disproportionate being one of them, and I, I certainly view the actions of the uh, Israeli Defence Force as disproportionate. But I'm concerned that that might suggest that had there been some less bombing, some less abuse hurled at the Gazan population that would have been acceptable. Like others, I'm happy to say that uh, I unreservedly will say that violence from whatever quarter is unacceptable. The term indiscriminate has been used too, um, and I, I'm not sure that you know, Israeli defence soldiers writing in children's school books in schools that they've destroyed and writing their regiment names in the wall um, is anything other than a calculated act. And I do worry that it's part of a, a wider issue of contempt for the mere existence of the Gazan community. The arms industry is a, a pernicious organisation worldwide, and they've been very much involved in this. Um, there's really government have a wonderful test centre right on, on their doorstep with gas and guinea pigs or sitting ducks. And I have to say it's my view that there are sick minds at play. We don't need new weapons. We don't need the so-called smart weapons. As my colleague Claudia Beamish said, we saw firsthand what the consequence of their so-called smart weapons was, and that was the, the death of 11 members of one family in a very confined area. So I'm proud that the Scottish Government called for an arms embargo. And like my colleague Cara Hilton, um, I would contrast with the virtual silence from elsewhere. Um, I commend my colleague Jean Urquhart's motion alluded to by Alison Johnston about boycott, divestment and sanctions. I think that is the route that we need to take. Um, others have talked about uh, the role of the UN and I welcome the General Secretary Ban Ki-moon's description of <coughs> excuse me, events as being intolerable and unacceptable. Um, we have heard also of the challenges of delivering aid, and that is compounded by the dearth of infrastructure that exists in that, that location. 
Uh, what, what I want to say in relation to um, Drew Smith's comments about the Scottish community and what we just heard from Mr McIntosh there, in my view, a victim is a victim. I do not need to know whether they profess to have a faith or indeed have no faith. I think a victim is a victim full stop, and I would abhor Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and I would commend the, the, the Jewish communities, particularly in the US. Cleveland and Boston have been very active in the organisation Code Pink. Uh, the motion talks about living in peace with dignity and security, and uh, uh, I would like to commend to people who haven't already seen it. There's a, a, a wonderful YouTube clip of it. Rafif Zadia, I hope I pronounced her name right. It's a wonderful poem called We Choose Life, Sir. And there's a line that says, Every day we wake up and we choose life. Life is going to be intolerable for the citizens of Gaza if that blockade is maintained. The International Red Committee of the Red Cross and the US, uh, UN have said it's illegal. We must end that blockade now. We must renew our efforts to ensure that there is a, a lasting peace and a two-state solution. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on James Dorn, and after which move the closing speech from the Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. I had not initially intended to speak in this debate, but I feel the, that I should. I had the uh, privilege of, of speaking at a, a demo on Buchanan Street about four weeks ago, and the, the strength of feeling about this horrendous issue was overwhelming. The, the, what, what was very positive was that people that were passing the demo, that weren't going to the demo, that were shopping in Buchanan Street, were very sympathetic to what was going on there. I don't usually take part in demos. It's just not the sort of politician uh, that I, I have been. But the, the sites that I had seen on social media the week running up to that broke my heart and, and made me feel that I had to take part in this one. This one meant more than, than almost any other one that we had. I mean, I, I, I take the point about what Ken McIntosh says about people feeling worried because of the imbalance, although I'll come back to the, the imbalance thing in a minute. Uh, I don't know anybody in my circles or certainly in, in, in this chamber who said that this has anything, got anything to do with people being Jewish. Nobody in this chamber has said that this has got anything to do with Israel's right to self-defence. What it's got to do with is Israel's completely indiscriminate and completely disproportionate attack on the people of Gaza. Anybody who could look at the, 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 the photos and the films that we've seen and see children with half their heads missing and some other horrendous sights. I, I saw when Patricia Ferguson was speaking that she was clearly visibly upset about what she was having to talk about. And I think that's how most of us feel in here. This is not an attack on any community. As a matter of fact, it's us coming, trying to come to the safeguard of a particular community. In this case, it's the people of Gaza. There are wrongs being taken place there. Hamas, nobody supports Hamas. I haven't heard anybody come out and support Hamas or, or the, the rocket firing or the tunnels, as many other people have said here. But let's get things in proportion. And bombing schools, bombing hospitals, targeting utilities, that is not the actions of a, a, a reasonable government. That's not the actions that Israel should be taking. If they're serious about wanting to live in peace with their neighbours, they're certainly going the wrong way about it. What I would ask them to do is lift that blockade. I asked the minister uh, in my motion that I had put down earlier on to look at how the Scottish government, it was mentioned by Sandra White earlier on, look at if the Scottish government could look at almost like a, 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 an embargo on trading with the illegal settlements. The illegal settlements shouldn't be there. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be encouraging them in any way and I think that may be some way towards sending a message that we here in Scotland support and stand by the people of Gaza and Palestine. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, I now call on the Minister to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Mr Youssef, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Normally it's customary to thank uh, the member for bringing this debate to the, the chamber and of course I, I do for securing that cross-party support but I think I can speak certainly on behalf of the government possibly even on behalf of the chamber that it's a debate we'd rather not be having. Uh, it's often commented and it has been commented actually once or twice by the, the speakers here and I must uh, make reference to the tone of the debate I think it's been exemplary uh, across the chamber and what is a very difficult and emotional uh, quite rightly emotional debate, but uh, I think we've done ourselves well in that regard. But it's often commented that conflict is in our nature as human beings. Uh, hum humanity and the 
pages of history have never had a time without some sort of conflict. However, I believe that empathy is also very much a part of our human nature too. Even the hardest, coldest hearts cannot fail to be moved by the scenes of devastation and destruction that we've seen unfolding in the Gaza Strip. Some of those statistics, which of course there is a story behind every single one, have been mentioned by members across this chamber. Almost 2,000 Gazans killed, the majority of them, vast majority of them, the UN suspects being civilian. 458 children killed. One and a half million people have no or very limited access to water. 200,000 people in the Gaza Strip in need of emergency food aid. Over 65,000 people made homeless. A health system on the verge of utter and complete collapse with 24 health facilities either damaged um, or facing acute shortages of medicine. The Scottish Government cannot, uh, will not stand idly by while this takes place. We have to be proactive and we have to be unequivocal in the messages that we deliver. Uh, of course we condemn all violence. We have, every single member that has stood up has condemned all of that violence and uh, the Scottish Government uh, also joins in their remarks that make no mistake about it. Rockets that are fired into Israel are wrong. They are designed to injure and to kill indiscriminately. Uh, this government says they must stop and must stop now. Everybody agrees, of course, that Israel uh, has a right to live in security and safety. However, it must be widely recognized and stated on the record that the Israeli government's response has been utterly and completely disproportionate and it must be condemned in the strongest possible manner for that. And those who fail to condemn it, and there are some on these islands who have failed to condemn it. They are doing themselves, but also humanity and, and injustice. A provocation, and yes, there is provocation. A provocation does not relieve one of accountability for how one chooses to respond. Now, all of us believe that an immediate and long-term ceasefire is needed. Yes, we've seen a ceasefire extended beyond the 72 days uh, period, 72 hours uh, period, and all of us are hoping that it extends into a long-term ceasefire. We, of course, need the, uh, those that are firing rockets into Israel to immediately put down their weapons, the Israeli government to, of course, cease its fire. But, of course, we must go to the, the, the inhumanity of that situation and ensure that the ceasefire, though is important in terms of dropping and stopping the, the weapon fire, the blockade must be lifted. Uh, Gaza is, as some have said here, an open-air prison. That is not my words. That is the words of the Prime Minister, David Cameron, in 2010. Uh, it is an open-air prison. It is collective punishment. Uh, although the powers of foreign affairs, of course, uh, reserved uh, by and large to the UK government, uh, the Scottish government, I believe, has been decisive in its action. I'll try to respond to some of the questions that came uh, from the chamber. Uh, we've donated uh, £500,000 to the UN flash appeal to the UNRWA uh, flash appeal for shelter and, and medicine. It's important that we did that, although we do not have a ring fence budget for emergency aid. As I said, we cannot uh, stand idly by. And I would urge people to continue to donate. Uh, the DEC has launched an appeal, uh, and you can see more information on their website on how to donate. Uh, one of the first offers we've made was about medical assistance and opening up our hospitals for medical treatment. Uh, some members have mentioned that they've been contacted about a, a delay. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, just spoke last week, uh, had a teleconference with the Director of Medical Aid for Palestinians in Gaza, uh, MAP Director uh, in Gaza. Uh, we told them about the specialisms that we have here in Scotland. Uh, we also heard about the priority of cases that they have in Gaza. And the next step is for uh, those consultants on the ground in Gaza to give us a list of the priorities, cases that they need treated. Uh, but make no mistake about it, the Scottish Government faces the exact same obstacles as anybody else does. Uh, there is a blockade, an illegal and inhumane blockade of Gaza uh, we are, uh, at this moment, experiencing difficulty in bringing people to Scotland. That said, uh, we received a letter from the Prime Minister in response to the First Minister's letter uh, on this situation. And the Prime Minister, at the end of his letter, said that the UK intends to also offer its hospitals to treat, uh, as we called for them to do, to treat uh, the injured in Gaza in UK hospitals and the Scottish hospitals. He was aware of the offer from Scottish hospitals. So logistically, hopefully we'll have some assistance from the UK government. But let me give every assurance to all the members here uh, that we are doing our utmost to be able to treat those in Gaza uh, where we can and when we can. 
the UK government must uh, bring more urgency to its actions. That was the letter that the First Minister sent to the Prime Minister. Uh, the UK, I believe, has been unfortunately painfully silent and uh, too stagnant in their actions. I spoke to Baroness Warsi uh, the night that she chose to leave the government, which I think would have been a painfully difficult decision uh, for her. And I commended her on her actions, but agreed with her entirely that the UK's government's position on Gaza has been painfully silent and indefensible. If they cannot be stronger on this issue, then at the very least we urge that the UK uh, and all of us are not complicit uh, in any of the atrocities that are taking place in the Gaza Strip. Uh, that's why we called for an immediate arms embargo. The UN has said that there's a strong possibility that international law has been violated. Ban Ki-moon, after the shelling of the UN shelter in Rafah, has said that that was a moral outrage and a criminal act. There must be an embargo. And make no mistake about it, and Alison Johnson quite right to raise the point about the plant in Fife, make no mistake about it, whether that company is Scottish, English, Northern Irish, or Welsh, we believe that there should be a complete arms embargo, and it's disgraceful that profit is being put over compassion. Sandra White and Alison Johnson asked us to look at, and other members asked us to look at the procurement legislation. I know that campaign has gone into the Deputy First Minister. Uh, she is aware of that, and she is looking at it and exploring what can be done in terms of illegal settlements. It should be said the UK government's own guidance says that they do not encourage or support trade with illegal settlements, so that, that should be put very much on the record. Uh, presenting officer, let me also address Ken McIntosh's point and ones that were made by, by, by others uh, as well. Uh, if, they are, uh, if the Jewish community uh, in Glasgow are feeling uh, that they uh, are, uh, are perhaps a victim to anti-Semitism because of the rising tensions uh, in the Middle East, let me give them an assurance that the Scottish Government will stand with them. Any anti-Semitism is to be absolutely abhorred. Uh, I have spoken to the Lord Advocate about it this morning. I will give them an assurance to speak to the Lord Advocate again to keep, continue to monitor uh, that situation. Uh, Presenting officer, I just want to end on uh, a story. I, I think we get caught up sometimes in statistics and we forget that there's a story behind every single one of those statistics. And again, this is not about being pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. It is simply at its very base being pro-humanitarian. And I commend, I, I, I urge everybody to look at the story of a mother uh, in Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip by the name of Wajdan Shamala. Uh, read her story if you can. Uh, she's a mother of three children who moved back to the Gaza Strip and you have to hear her story to believe it. She asks if uh, she has three children and she asks all of us to think well or not, uh, think of our own children or think of our own nieces and nephews or our own grandchildren. And imagine you had three of them and every night before she goes to sleep she has to ask herself the question, does she have all three children sleep in her bed with her and her husband so that if a rocket hits the house then they all die together as a family? Or does she as she does some nights and would we, if we were in that situation, does she split two children with her and one with her husband so that if a missile hits, then maybe some of them will survive. And if you are to split up your children and your family, presiding officer, then how do you choose which children you're to, <coughs> excuse me, which children you would put in which room? That is a choice that no parent should have to make and no individual uh, should have to make. The Scottish Government calls on the immediate lifting of the blockade. There is a political solution, not a military solution. Settlements are illegal and should be removed. We support that two-state solution. And at the heart of the injustice over the decades, presiding officer, has been, of course, that Israel has a right to safety and security, but at the heart of the injustice is the utter denial of a viable Palestinian state over the decades. Above and beyond the politics is the humanitarian, and the Scottish Government stands and unites with every single member across this chamber to say that children are not terrorists, whether they're playing on a beach or feeding pigeons or sleeping in a UN shelter. Innocent civilians must never be targeted. And that's why we call for a UN investigation immediately into the killing of civilians. And so that those that have been violating international law, or possibly been violating international law, feel the full force of international justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank you all. I now close this meeting of Parliament.